Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this special virtual panel discussion. My name is Kikali Suma, and I'm the 2020 to 2021 Curatorial Fellow here at the Treehouse Museum. Now in its second pilot year, the Tale of Today Emerging Artist Fellowship supports promising and emerging talent from Chicago's arts community through career building opportunities, seminars with various arts professionals, and a culminating pop-up exhibition at the museum, as well as a partner program at Expo Chicago. This year, we have the works of our four fellows hosted on Expo Chicago's online exhibition platform. This afternoon's virtual panel discussion will explore the conceptual and programmatic impact of the fellowship program as well as the works of the fellows currently on view. Joining me in this conversation are the fellows themselves, Alexandria Regbu, Devin T. Mays, Miriam Tatavi, and Unimi Abasi Udo. The fellowship is inspired by the many facets of the Nickerson Mansion, as well as the exemplary model, which is an exemplary model for innovative achievement, a showcase of cutting edge design, and an incubator for learning and studies. Um, so I'd like to introduce the fellows that will be with me on the panel today. Alexandria Redbu is an interdisciplinary artist and curator whose practice draws from history, lived experiences, and her own imagination to deepen her connectivity to the natural world. Her work is driven by memories, whether real or dreamt, as well as the history and culture Devin T. May's practice is driven by an investigation of the so-called in-between space, created by the polarities in his identity. He is interested in developing a visual language that defines and redefines the in-between being. Mariam Taghavi is a Tehran-born, Chicago-based interdisciplinary artist working in photography, installation, video, publication, drawing and performance. She employs a post-studio site-specific practice that weighs in on and intervenes in existing modes of production. Unimi Abasi Udo is an artist and graphic designer whose work is driven by the idea of making peace with the notion of the void. Udo works across various mediums and is interested in topics including surface and absence, text as image, and blackness as a color and contra construct. Um, and so, with all that being said, <laughs> I'd like to ask a general question to the fellows. What led you to consider the works that you're showing here in the museum today? Thinking about this space's history, its architectural context, um, competing with what's on the walls. What was the process of coming up with work, thinking through a process, and making a piece that makes sense in this space? Maybe would you like to start? Sure. Um, I mean, I think um, I'll start off with my initial encounter with the space, which um, is the first day um, when I came to get the tour of the space, mm -hmm. you know, it was both the, the mansion itself and the objects in here, and also the other exhibition that you have of Mika's and Nate's work. So I remember, you know, from the early moments of that encounter, there is this sensory overload, you know, in a space that is fraught with its own form and style mm -hmm. and history. So the question that I had was, how am I going to actually um, start a dialogue with a place that has this very dominant monologue of its own? And so that was my first kind of encounter. And then later on, as we, you know, progress in the, in the residency itself, I recognize that there are other limitations in terms of how we can engage with the history because exactly of, you know, 
the preservation regulations and um, how everything is incredibly precious in this space. <coughs> so then I think there were these different sort of like um, stages of recognizing how I can situate myself in relationship to this space. Um, and, and then at a certain point, I decided that I am going to um, surrender to the demands of the space mm -hmm. and um, work within the parameters that I'm given. Because when I do site-specific work, you know, I'm writing on the walls, I'm carving them, I'm cutting them out. So this is obviously very like impossible. Yeah. Here. I couldn't even think about it. But also, um, even if I were to sort of like modify those gestures, I, I felt that th that's not really going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I would say it happened in different stages. Um, and I was, um, I, was, I decided to go with what is given to me here and then, you know, sort of like bring in my work maybe on a more formal level in conversation with the space. Mm -hmm. I can stop here mm -hmm. and let other people <laughs> speak. <laughs> Would you like to talk about your work? Yeah, I think, um, so my first encounter like with the Dre House Museum was actually with the last panel of today, Fellowship Cycle. Mm -hmm. I first came in to see the installation of Yinka Shonabari's work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think from the beginning, my impression of the Dre House space or like contemporary art um, interacting with the Dre House's environment was all really, really shaped by seeing um, his work, which is like, you know, very bold, very graphic, thematically, and um, I guess it's always period appropriate in mm -hmm. terms of being Victorian. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of his mannequins being clothed in like Victorian era garb updated mm -hmm. in um, Dutch wax print fabrics. And so when I started thinking about making my own work, um, I wanted it to engage, I think, in a similar way. Also, um, given the opulence of the, of the space, I really wanted it to be, um, so a lot, of my, a lot of my other work is generally fairly minimal, fairly low contrast. Um, but in this kind of space, I wanted to try to be bigger and bolder mm -hmm. and sort of meet the space on its terms. And I think following the sort of inspiration um, I've gotten from seeing the Yinka Shonabari show, and also in my own practice, often working with archival and like, canonical materials to produce work that took a period-specific um, image or cultural artifact and represented it in a new way mm. to sort of like challenge both the past norms and like the present conditions sense. of the museum. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Alexandra, what about you? Yeah, I mean, similarly to Miriam and uh, Uno, like my first uh, interaction with the Driehaus Museum was the Yinka Shonabari exhibition. Um, and also thinking about, well, for one, what I was looking at were little bits and pieces of the architecture or experiences in the space that felt familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So I initially, um, when the proposal was sent out for a call for artists for this fellowship, I was really excited about this idea of the house museum and how environments, um, artists could contribute to building out these environments that integrated their personal stories or sort of narratives. Um, and of course, when we got the tour of the museum itself, we learned a little bit more about what the Nickerson family had contributed to kind of sharing their own story mm -hmm. and the um, values of aesthetics that um, they have brought into the space with the architecture and different objects that have been collected here in the museum. Mm -hmm. So um, I initially like really jumped to my own um, 
memories of my great grandparents' house here in Chicago in Garfield Park. Um, it was a 19th century mansion, they called. And there are just little pieces here and there that um, as a child I remember interacting with the uh, hidden doors, right? Um, back stairwells, things of that nature that <coughs> kind of initiated a sense of play um, for me and my cousins and family members. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited about that. Um, but the other things that came up for me were sort of the questions of like, okay, who were the hands, you know, behind making such um, an experience like this possible? And so I started thinking about, you know, um, the conversation of the Nickerson family sort of history. I think Miriam brought up this idea of the monologue and I kind of already was in this process of writing my own story, my own monologue, if you will, through this film, um, the introduction of my prologue to Amiri origin story, The Reason Why We Hunt. So um, yeah, like these, these notions of home and what's familiar to me is usually kind of my entry point and then allowing for those gaps to be the space in which mm -hmm. I can sort of insert myself and mm -hmm. ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Um, Devin, how about you? Yeah, I, I think that everything that's been said so far is also true for me as well. Um, <clears throat> I think my first, my first actual interaction with this space was just as a bystander, as a kind of pedestrian walking up and down Erie. Um, about 10 years ago, I used to work for an ad agency um, that used to be where the Conrad Hotel is. And so the mansion kind of, it kind of sticks out, mm -hmm. you know? It doesn't look like anything else around it. Um, and so I began to always notice people coming in and out of this place that looked like it was a private space that required another kind of access for, to gain entry. And so then I think when I realized what was happening inside, I became more kind of curious about, oh, here's this thing I've, I've passed by for so many years, never really asked questions of, made a lot of assumptions about, but this might be an opportunity to kind of have an encounter with the thing I thought I knew, mm -hmm. which I feel is very, which, which I feel like aligns a lot with the practice that I have. It really is about kind of having these encounters. It's about inviting encounters and having these experiences, even if these encounters are with things that I think I know, or things I think I've passed before, or things I think I've been in relationship with before, um, not relying on what I know uh, to tell me what's right. And so I think when it came time to working in this space, mm. I want to kind of keep that in mind. I didn't want to be right about it. Um, and I didn't want to become righteous in my own exhibition. That I wanted to find ways to invite more encounters with this encounter. How can I kind of extend another invitation to have another experience by facilitating this install? Mm -hmm. And I hope that's what I've done. I mean, I really, I'm really not sure, to be <laughs> honest with you, um, which is also part of the work. I mean, it's like, to be completely honest, I, I don't really have that many plans before I get into a space. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'm always thinking, I'm always moving about the world, but I don't plan things out like a project necessarily. Because um, I don't want to kind of plan my encounters that way either. I think it, 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 it's my own probably... It's easy to do that from time to time, but I think that it's that default of possession that I worry about, that if I do plan it out to a T to kind of let my desire manage the expectation of the outcome of the thing, mm -hmm. that it might actually get in the way of the thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, and in all cases actually in my practice, I'm trying my best to actually get out of the way. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, that's, that's how I arrived to to what I'm sharing here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick up on that a little <laughs> bit and push back. Um, you talk sure. about getting out of the way, um, sure. but anytime well, it can be argued 
Yeah. But anytime you place an object in space, right, you yeah. are standing between whatever thing you're channeling, right? It's not a neutral channel. It's not, um, you know, every bridge is made. Mm, mm, um, mm. And so whatever piece you're putting here, mm. there is a decision making on your part. For and sure. I want to kind of like understand that. Um, <clears throat> the encounters are not neutral, right? They're charged by the space, by the person who curates, picks, manages, um, massages, um, shapes them. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to know, um, you mean with this piece right here that we're looking at, what is the specific encounter that you are hoping that we have? Again, you know, I think what's interesting, it's, I've never thought about, it's probably not true. I shouldn't say I never thought about an encounter not being neutral. Maybe I have, I just. Can I jump in and just say that I want to like clarify because I feel mm -hmm. like you're speaking specifically about human encounters. Right? No, I'm, I'm using the encounter that Devin is talking about. Okay. Because um, he's defined it, or he hasn't defined it yet um, in mm -hmm. terms of its boundaries. Um, and so mm -hmm. and he seems very open to any kinds of encounters, whether it be human, object, experiential, event related. Um, so, rather than define it for him, I'm asking him to shape it. Gotcha. Like, what gotcha. do you mean by encounter? Um, I think that's important, though. Yeah, 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 yeah because yeah. I'm making the argument that yeah. no encounter is unshaped. Um, every bridge is constructed. Every choice has intention, and nothing is neutral. And so, yeah, those are my, those are kind of my uh, understanding of, it, and I want to understand. Um, why the specificity of these things here? Yeah, you know, um, and to be honest, uh, there is, it's not about any of the objects I'm using. It's not really, um, I'm not using them to define anything necessarily. Uh, maybe more or less it's what I'm saying or what I'm trying to kind of invite is an opportunity to maybe have a revelation. Mm. And, and I think less so is the practice about things. It's more so kind of an invitation or an opportunity for them for them to demonstrate that it can be up to them. Up so I to think up to whatever the objects, what up to whatever the kind of practice, whatever is happening. So there's mm -hmm. a difference between there's the aboutness of things and then there's the becoming of things. I'm less so interested in the aboutness of things. I'm more so interested in the becoming of things. And so even to talk about an encounter as being neutral and not neutral, I'm not even at that, I'm not at that stage necessarily in the, pro in the practice. Yeah. I'm not saying that yeah, other yeah. people won't and have that encounter because you meet people where they are, you meet things where they are all the time. I think for me, I'm trying my best not to kind of subjugate the encounter, which I realize we do all the time. I mean, you're doing it right now with the choice that you make. I wouldn't say, I'm, I'm, I'm not subjugating in the sense of like, for example, it's like how I think there used to be, I will hear people say all the time, art is subjective. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about that recently. I was like, well, no, it's not. We subjugate it. It's like me saying a tree is subjective. No, but we actually decide what a tree is or how a tree does what a tree does. But I don't know if a tree is inherently subjective. And that's how I think about art. Mm -hmm. Art is not an idea. Art is not a kind of uh, exhibition of ability or a manifestation of kind of like my intellectual understanding of something. That's not what art is at all. It's actually the thing that happens outside of that for me, or maybe even in between. And so I think that's where, when I talk about these encounters, I think I do resist, again, cause I, I'm probably a little worried about always giving shape to things. Like who am I to tell you what the shape of a thing is? I'm actually more interested in kind of introducing the possibility of a thing becoming what a thing should become and actually participate in a thing that's always happening, which I believe, I won't say it's my job necessarily as an artist, but I do think art doesn't need me for it to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think that in many ways, so then I begin to think about like, well, what, what is, then what do I, why do I call myself an artist then? Like, why do I actually participate in these exercises? And I think a lot of it is, is, is that back to that surrender thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, just because I actually don't want to be right about it. I don't need to be good at it. I don't need to be impressive. 
I don't need to do any of these things in order to kind of participate in like the divinity of the tree. Mm. And so actually all I really want to do is kind of be a caretaker of it. Mm. And I want to be able to appreciate it. So that's when I talk about kind of getting in the way. It's like I can really enjoy the tree or decide to build the park. And so for me, it's like I'm actually more so interested in just having an encounter with the tree than saying, look at the park I just built. Mm. Okay, so you're kind of, you leave that experience open to whatever it is or happens to be. Um, at least that's what I'm taking away. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's not a, I don't think it's a neutral, I think that's the thing too. I don't think it's necessarily a neutral or a kind of like um, a defeated or a kind of a careless kind of thing. I think there's a, there's a very thin line between one saying like, hey, this is, this is it, this is the thing, you know, and kind of having a bit of hands off approach with it. Um, and being, not having a kind of accountability for like the thing that's also there. I'm not trying to remove my accountability at all. I actually am trying to, uh, trying to be present. I wanna have presence without making it about my attendance. And I think that's a very thin line. I think sometimes it, it, it can, it's always this kind of negotiation where how does one have presence without making it about their attendance? And so that's what gets back to my whole understanding of what these encounters are and how they are. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to meet Miriam where Miriam is. Mm. Now it's not for me to say like, this is where Miriam should be when she meets me there. But whatever that encounter is, that is the happening that I'm participating in. Mm -hmm. So kind of thinking, I kind of want to ride that line because you mentioned something about divinity and it made me think about Miriam's talismans. Because mm -hmm. um, there is a, a I don't know if it's a religious or a sacred quality. I don't know how you define it. Um, but, you know, talismans and talismanic objects, you know, imbue uh, a kind of magic either to a space or to an object. Um, and that's either for healing or for luck, or sometimes it can even become curses in that same sense. Um, so I wanted you to um, kind of continue that train of thought. Um, how are you thinking of these talismans? Mm -hmm. Is, that, is there a connection to the divine, um, sacredness, religion, um, and how are you navigating those things? Sure. I mean, uh, what Devin is just talking about, I am, I'm trying to see if I can also like um, enter what you're saying with the words control and improvisation. Sure, sure. Um, I think about that a lot in terms of like how much control am I inserting in this process, in the work, in my choice of material, mm -hmm. and then where is this sort of improvisation happening, which I think maybe it's slash epiphany, mm -hmm. slash like encounters with things that you didn't expect, um, <clears throat> sort of like allowing for this process to open this space that was not known to you prior to you getting on this thing that you're doing, right? Yeah. And my interest in the talismans mm -hmm. is also in that, where they are this sort of like interface between, you know, what I know, what I relatively know, and the potential that this talisman may conjure up, right? So, but my, my, my arrival to talismans was actually through like, um, you know, I, language kind of like, my work revolves around language and I use, um, and for a while I was using this sort of lens of translation to sort of make sense of my, my relationship to language. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, Here's one language, here's this other language. Translation is enabling the transference of like meaning from here to there. But in this process, there's also this kind of semantic field that part of it gets left behind. It's like not all meaning makes it to the other language because that's, they're wired differently. Mm -hmm. They're like, there's this, all this like strata that is not mm -hmm. allowing for this to happen. Um, and then sometimes it seems like the, the, the process of translation is like mark making in this host language, right? It's like, 
you are making these marks, but you're not necessarily like um, going into the, um, the, the the sign system. So then the talisman for me, like, was sort of like this mediator, facilitator between, you know, this language, this system of meaning making that we know and the tra ta talismans are operating on the margins of it. It's like, I am using the numerical and alphabetical elements from the language and it's important to what, what you know, this talisman, maybe it sounds like or what it does, but then I am actually pointing to something that does not exist in the dictionary of this language. I'm pointing mm -hmm. to something that is not yet known. Mm -hmm. I, the talisman claims that it's conjuring up powers that are otherwise invisible to us. Mm -hmm. So I am <coughs> interested in that mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, it's so like, you're thinking, of, so the talisman then is almost like a code, like right, that you're, right. that you're saying. So you're, you're, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you're pointing towards make making these codes that pull on the powers that are mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. um and you are using the forms of these numbers and these letters um but essentially what you're pointing to is the is that dialogue and that construct not necessarily the specificity of these words is that right it, yes or the specificity of these talismans because mm -hmm. i am appropriating the talismans mm -hmm. you know i I come across these talismans from different sources, but this particular work that I'm developing right now, and part of it we see here, is from like this 16th century exeget who, um, you know, collected all these talismans. And there is this um, sort of like instruction slash, slash description mm -hmm. to the talisman, what you need to do. Like, Maybe you need a drop of this. Maybe you need the tail mm -hmm. of a fox or something. Mm -hmm. So you need to sort of bring all these elements along. But the, the talisman, the text part, is really crucial mm -hmm. to it. And I think words have that kind of power. Like the, um, it's very scholarly from what I'm, under, what I'm understanding. Is, uh -huh. that, is that part of your interest? Kind of this, like, the study of these things, the scholarly, academic, sphere of it or is it academic i'm saying like i'm thinking of alchemy right you right. study there are books there are instructions there's text right. there are cantations mm -hmm. there's a specific signs sigils right. that you draw right. it's not this kind of like um it's not it's not similar to other types it, to other types of like magic practices per se right right, right. i mean so uh, that's what i'm asking is it are you interested in that sphere or is that just incidental Oh, am I, you know. uh, the sphere of the, the, the talisman actually doing something? No, the, the, the kind of academic... I am interested. I mean, definitely yeah. I have looked into the academic quote-unquote studies okay. of the talisman. Mm -hmm. I am definitely interested in that. Mm. Um, but it's also something that is not unfamiliar to me. It was, you know, I think like the mm. sort of post-war Iran was also like dealing with its mm -hmm. really say grotesque realities, and, mm -hmm. and I think the, the occult practices kind of had this reemergence, um, and and you know, it's something that was Super happening around me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't ever like sort of try to get into it to fix the problem, but I was definitely fascinated by it and I was, um, and then that kind of like is what I'm thinking now, mm. you know, I, mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily think that that had a particular impact, but now I'm like trying to understand talisman. It's like I am interested also in the form of these talismans. Mm. You know? um, as, as as a material, as a form, and as like that, that the sort of like the form of these letters and numbers can actually be a portal for what you like that um, desire and that wish that you attach to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's really interesting to, um, to think about this kind of written textual um, practice. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. um, and its connection to things, even something historic that you're talking about, like these new practices coming out of a post-war Iran. Um, I want to kind of make a connection between you and Alexandria here, mm -hmm. um, as I'm thinking of, because your essay is very textual, and I'm thinking of yours as very oral. Um, and you're interested in surrealism and these hmm. poetics and intention that um, point to a different reality. Similarly, like Miriam is pulling from a different reality. Um, <coughs> could you speak, you know, towards that kind of component within the work? Um, I don't know if you would call it magic, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, what is this outworldly context that you're interested in? Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, it's a really great observation. Those are some things that I've been swirling around with as I've been sitting over here myself. Um, this otherworldly context, I think, is just the fact that, you know, as a person, a human being, being the person that I am, you know, mm -hmm. there are so many aspects of my experience that are not validated um, in the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that surrealist studies really did for me when I was introduced to it 11 years ago. And one of the things that African literature has also done to me since I have really um, challenged myself to start to learn um, my own stories, right? And um, uh, learn about my histories kind of beyond, you know, uh, US slavery, but, you know, much, much further mm -hmm. into the past. Um, one of the things that surrealism sort of really opened up for me is just this um, idea that it is possible to sort of integrate um, our conscious state and our unconscious state. Um, me having always been a very, very um, visual person, but also an avid dreamer since I was a child, mm -hmm. that was one of the things as I have grown into adulthood that I always felt was like, um, you know, people don't really talk about their dreams out in the world, <laughs> and why is that? Um, not in public. And, and not in public, <laughs> right? Um, I even one time sat on a panel in which um, someone was asking me specifically about my surrealist research, and when she found out that I, within the collective that I'm a part of, Dumas Noir, that part of our practice and process is about you know, sharing our dreams with one another. She was like, oh, so you all are actually real surrealists. And it's like, yes, no, like these are um, the, uh, these are essential parts of the practice, right? Like the automatic writing, the dream journaling, um, poetry, um, jazz, improvisation. Like these are the experiences that um, honestly, in, in my educational experience, say for, the couple of opportunities that I had to really um, uh, embrace experiences to learn more, um, I've been denied. And you know, as a 30-year-old woman, like who has been, you know, deeply, uh, I teach in an educational forum. You know, I'm getting my second degree. Like this is the space that I've spent the most, most time in outside of my. Um, family, you know, mm -hmm. and spending time with my, you know, loved ones. Um, so one of the very qu first questions that um, my video, uh, the reason why we hunt sort of asks is, you know, um, what if the greatest crime against humanity was uh, to be robbed of your senses, right? And, and I, I feel that every time, especially in a place like Chicago, um, who has this rich, indigenous history, has a rich black history, um, has these rich immigrant communities in it, but it is so segregated, so um, deeply entrenched, and I think, um, I don't know, it's, it's corrupt. <laughs> I feel that every time I leave my, my home, you mm -hmm. know, my, I feel that every time I um, step out into the world and, and leave environments in which I feel safe and protected, and so, um, yeah, like the impetus for me and my work has really been to kind of um, affirm some of those experiences and, and, you know, put my stamp on what is true and what is real for me. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for just uh, the elders and the ancestors that have come before me. You know, I'm thinking about 
Toni Morrison's um, uh, labor of love as she worked with, worked with addressing the you know, discredited knowledges and communities of people who are often um, their stories, their voices, and interpretations, perspectives of the world are often um, delegitimized. I think of the work of Chenyo Achebe, who, um, you know, as a writer, as a literary scholar, um, was the first person in the 60s to actually tell a tale from an Afrocentric perspective of um, what it meant to experience mm -hmm. a colonizer, you know, in his village um, through this tale of the main character. Um, At least first in English. In English, yeah. yes, precisely. And um, thank you for that. Um, all of these things have, have been really important to my own journey and just kind of, you know, trying to decolonize um, my own experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also welcome a more holistic um, opportunity for me as an artist um, but more than an artist, just as a human being to explore and enter into the world and experience the world. Mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of tease apart a particular uh, aspect of your practice. When you talked about surrealism, right, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like, Jungian or Freudian? Um, because these are both kind of Western lineages mm -hmm. that surrealism kind of comes out of in the signs and symbols that is... Um, underpins this practice, the images that came of, is one of a Western kind of lineage, right? And I'm understanding you pulling from that, but also wanting to pull from these kind of, this kind of like Afro, Afrocentrist um, diasporic lineages as well. Um, how are you negotiating the um, intersection of those two things? And are they contradictory? Are they, do they amplify each other? Um, because there's a little bit of friction there, right? Because there are two ways of telling the same sto or similar stories. I think there are way more than two ways of telling a story, but I think um, um, to your point, I guess I don't, although uh, Jung and Freud are part of sort of the surrealist conversation, I don't really attribute them to, um, I think more of them in the realm of psychology um, and I don't necessarily contribute them to the birth of sort of surrealist practice. Surrealist practice for me um, has simply been about uh, liberating the mind, freeing the mind. And that goes way before um, uh, Jung and, and Freud. I mean, that goes back to sort of just, you know, indigenous practices of initiation, like why we, see, why we send people away from home in the first place, mm -hmm. you know, to be shocked. Um, have our senses shocked to the core and um, find, uh, use our resources within ourselves to sort of mm -hmm. bring us back mm -hmm. um, from, you know, the, the forest back to, um, to home. Um, but you don't necessarily see it as, because I think that the way that I'm um, kind of conceptualizing it, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with Pulling from dreams is, wasn't something that Freud or Jung invented, right? Mm -hmm. But the codification of it as an art practice, right? The theories that came out of their psychology practices informed the artists that were, you know, working during that time. And this is like post-war oh, Europe. World II, um, yeah. yeah, so they're, they're both, A, shocked by the devastation of the war and the kind of rationalization and humanity that they thought was going to lead to a kind of like modernism that was going to be liberatory, it did not, right? It led to things like colonialism, so this intense violence. And then we have Dadaism, which is kind of a rejection mm -hmm. of the canon up to that point and a kind of pure experimentation with whatever, a kind of anti-art in that sense. And then we have surrealism coming through that, um, that Negative. takes on this kind of individualist identity, the dreams, this, the, the ideas of the um, subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, but as we see those things, travel to different spaces. Like I'm thinking specifically of South America, we have magical realism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, has its lines towards surrealism, but its application, the images that they're employing, the kind of indigenous narratives they're pulling from, like Clarice Respector, the Isle of Star, like all of these stories take on a very different um, uh, kind of instantiation. And the kind of theoretical framework that they use around it is one of cannibalism 
we cannibalize this thing, right? And it's become part of us, so it's become us in some way. And I see that too with um, kind of Chinua Achebe's work. Like he adopts English, mm -hmm. and he knows that it's a colonial language, mm -hmm. but it's make, he's making it now his own. He's making it West African in a <coughs> sense. And so I think that's where I'm kind of like asking you that question, especially within the context of the United States, which pulls from all these different places. Um, I just wanted to know your intentionality between the different strains um, of discourse and work material, as um, Miriam was talking about. Um, is it, do you kind of take it as it is? Um, are you, you know, how are you processing that? Is there any friction there? Or is it just, does it just feel natural? Um, yeah, I think all of the above. And I think um, while at different points of the journey and experience, mm -hmm. I may think that I'm taking a position, like mm -hmm. there's always something else uh, behind me or in front of yeah. me that kind of reorients yeah. me in, in that. Um, I love that you're bringing up um, this idea of cannibalism mm -hmm. and the way that that's kind of, you know, one of the questions that I ask also in um, the film as well is, you know, um, what becomes of those who have been eaten? Mm -hmm. You know, do you become, um, are you what you eat or do you become something else? Mm -hmm. And I think that at this stage I can just say that like, I don't know, you know. You're I'm, still eating. I'm, I know. Still, I'm still eating. Uh, and I'm still becoming, yeah. you know. Um, Which and brings us I'm back to you. I'm actually, yeah. uh, more importantly though, I'm trying less and less to make myself available to being eaten off of. Mm -hmm. And that is that to me right now is like the most important line boundary that needs to be drawn into the sand. Because I've gone so long um, having experiences in which people were eating off of me, not even being fully awake or aware to the many ways in which mm -hmm. my, my space, my creativity, um, uh, the things that I've generated have been you know, mm -hmm. consumed. Consumed, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, kind of thinking of this road and towards becoming like, I feel like Uno, your work seems like it takes a decidedly solid position. I mean, as subtle as the critique is. <laughs> um, it feels like you have the most incisive thing to say. Is, is, am, I, am I wrong? Am I projecting onto this work? Like, how would you discuss your insertion into the museum? Well, I think, um, so a lot, a lot of my work, especially um, my work dealing with sort of archival and canonical um, images, mm -hmm. like artifacts, I'm not trying, so I think something that's fairly, I come up a lot of use, like when people are working with archival, um, archival materials is attempting, I guess using, using the material of the past to construct a narrative about that past and to say something, or to critique that past based on, um, the like the artifacts that is produced the presentation of these um, of these materials <clears throat> or to say uh, I guess say something new mm. about the past or say something um, even to say something against the past mm. I often feel like I'm not I'm not quite doing that I think I mean, it's impossible as like uh, Devin was saying, it's impossible not, obviously, to have an opinion, not to have a point of view. But what I see, um, my, or was that what I aim to do, at least, is to make, um, I guess, reveal things as they are, or to reveal, like, to reveal the existing conditions um, the actual circumstances. And so if, um, if in the end it becomes a critique, it's like, well, I didn't make the conditions bad. I just told you what they were. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just saying that this is a condition. Um, and so my piece uh, is called 
I think you're like referencing the title, I don't know if it's called um, Idle Hands, Grace Rose, and it references or it appropriates the um, image of a painting on, I think it's like 1866, 18, no, 1886, 1888 painting by Frederick Sandys um, called Grace Rose, held in the collection of the Yale Museum of British Art. Um, it's an image I chose because, as I mentioned before, I was really interested in the period of the, so the Gilded Age, late Victorian period of the museum, and how that period reflects or mirrors our current, um, our current age. Mm -hmm. In particular, I was attracted to the pre-Raphaelite arts, like pre-Raphaelite paintings um, held in this museum's collection. And the way the figures in those paintings, as well as the whole, um, both of the Dre House Museum and then like the con contemporary like, commercial artwork, art world speak to certain notions of labor and leisure um, and beauty. And like what are the conditions of labor that allow for, for this leisure and for this beauty? Uh, and so, uh, and I think actually that the beauty is a really uh, important part of that. A lot of the times when I'm looking at these uh, canonical archival works, something that I think something that annoys me that I think comes up a lot is like, oh, you know, the thing in the past is bad, or the thing this person who's visiting is a bad person, therefore their production cannot be beautiful. Like, oh, it has no aesthetic value, or it's tainted in its taintedness. Mar like, like if beauty is, is it. Is it tainted by its politics? Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think I'm trying to remember which philosopher it was. It's like, oh, the only, are, are things only beautiful if they're morally good or yeah. morally pure? Um, and I think that the actual, actually the alignment of, uh, of beauty with things that aren't necessarily morally pure or um, straight, like straightforward is important to reckon with and to recognize. And so I guess, in uh, my piece, I am thinking about and looking at the, as I said, like the beauty, that labor, uh, that leisure, like what's the kind of labor that builds a house, like who's the kind of labor that lets you, that lets your own labor then be arranging flowers um, as, a, as a portrait model, mm -hmm. or even, um, even beyond that, what kind of labor has allowed someone to own this painting of somebody laboring in, a, um, in an even less, so like they're sort of the intense labor that sort of gets diluted up until you have an image of labor that is basically leisure. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like there are many layers yeah. <laughs> to this and many, um, modalities, at least if you critique, one is of, you know, the sitter, one is of the painter to some extent, then the commissioner, essentially the client, the owner, and as it gets passed down, you know, kind of like a sphere of um, participants in the production of this work, but primarily in its ownership and the leisure that surrounds it. Yeah. Um, I think I want to go back to what you said about you're presenting something as is. Mm. Um, because a right this isn't this isn't data right this no. is a painting already a subjective piece right mm -hmm. and even then you're not presenting in its whole whole context yeah. you're presenting a very specific moment within this painting which itself is a curated moment right mm -hmm. that was constructed in the studio and i don't think you're one to kind of accept history as is, we understand as a constructive narrative, right? So then how you are negotiating this presentation as is in a medium that is aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? And in one that you have very specifically selected, yeah. curated, yeah. Mm -hmm. honed in on a narrative that you want to tell. Um, are you comfortable positioning yourself against a particular kind of history? As opposed to, I'm just neutral, I'm just showing how it is. Because we know that's just not how it is. Well, 
I don't think those things are um, necessarily exclusive. Elaborate. In that I can say, like obviously I have opinions about the state of the world, the state of history, the state of the past. But um, I think I, and so those opinions influence the work I make and also the messages I want people to receive yeah. from that work. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the um, I try to resist pure didacticism and saying like, oh, this is what I want you to think about this. And so mm -hmm. I think the... It's an encounter, essentially. Yeah, yeah I think the, and I think the ambiguity um, of the encounter is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, like, okay, and in terms of, it's obviously, obviously presenting a curated, um, as you say, curated, selected moment, um, both choosing the painting, choosing this moment of the mm -hmm. painting, choosing its production um, method, which is not how the painting was produced. Obviously, mm -hmm. now it's a print on transparency, like a mirror. Frame yeah, a vanitas, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, again, isn't necessarily opposed to presenting things or letting things speak or reveal themselves as they are. And this is, I think Alexandra mentioned um, that teaching, um, so I'm also like a teaching like graphic design first, first year students and something I think that's very important um, coming from like a background or training as a graphic designer is the idea that you are, I think, good, in my opinion, good graphic design, good design um, presents content mm -hmm in a way that it is most itself. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to... Uh, if you're trying to tell a message, what is, the, like, what is the medium, what is the presentation in which that message and its container are like, most aligned? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to me um, <laughs> that all of you are kind of skirting around this big topic, <laughs> right? Most itself yeah. being, right? Mm -hmm. Um, truth, there's a sense that's, I feel like that's the word kind of which we're all kind of circling around and obviously it's a big word right? and, it, and, and the ideas and the connotations and the uh, consequences and, the, and what we're accountable you know, <clears throat> it's kind of like all at stake um, and I'm kind of thinking right now to kind of shift gears a little bit because we're not going to answer this question of truth and you know four minutes right? mm -hmm. um, so uh, that will be you know at a bar late at night somewhere yeah. um, but for now um, thinking of like um, what remains right what remains of your experiences here um, having encountered mm -hmm. this space um, having kind of seen visions from the past of the Treehouse Museum the Nickerson Mansion mm -hmm. what the walls are saying and bringing to the space but also the kind of like ghosts, maybe specters that exhibit and, and how that communicates to us and the objects that are here, but also the experience uh, within this space um, and how it presents itself. Um, thinking of you know, um, your time in the museum, your time in this fellowship, the encounters you had over this time, what remains for you? What are you walking away with? Mm -hmm. um, and I know this is a cruel question because I'm going to ask you to do it in, <laughs> in five se sentences or less. <laughs> um, but bear with me, um, Miriam, if you'd like and to start. Of course, seems I'm like first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're itching to say your response. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I think meeting everyone in this setting, like having the conversations that we had during COVID, it was a really great way of, uh, for us to come together and to talk about things that, you know, you talk about your practice more than you do about things that happen around your practice. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, really appreciated that we had these transparent conversations. Um, even it was virtual, we were still like sharing um, 
you know, our concerns and doubts and questions and mm -hmm. everything. So I am looking forward to having this conversation continue. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about the physical studio visits that we can do soon-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like my encounter with the museum and what I did here, I am really still processing it. Mm -hmm, of um, course. But I think one of the most sort of maybe potent moments were the day that we were installing and the place that felt so untouchable up to that point. Has now been touched. Then we were kind of like having a different relationship, mm -hmm. to, even if it was like laying on the rug you mm -hmm. know, and just resting or figuring out the next thing. So I think that and then seeing all the work come together in this space is something that I am still processing. Mm -hmm. That was more than five sentences. Yeah, I'm yeah sorry. no problem. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> oh, no. yeah, I think similarly the opportunity to connect with um, and the um, at sort of a level of like rigor dis like discussing our practice, discussing um, our methods of approach and our, like our goals uh, for our work was really generative and I'm excited to continue it, as Miriam said, moving forward mm. in terms of producing, um, starting the space, producing work. I think it gave me a different way to think of site-specific work. Mm. I thought, um, site-specific work is more um, like maybe more sculptural or installation based, but now like producing site-specific work, um, it's more site-specific in its content yeah. as well. And then just like the technical challenge of producing yeah. my piece, um, working at a larger scale, it's a more complex uh, production, um, like fabrication routine was a real learning experience. Mm -hmm. And like, well, now, now I know how to do now it. Now you know. <laughs> my friend would ever talk to me again. <laughs> Maybe I can do it again. <laughs> Hopefully soon. <laughs> What are your thoughts, Alexandria? Man, I, I think very much so. I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm thinking a lot about um, things unseen and things mm -hmm. unheard. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to you know, consider it, whether it's in my writing, whether it's in my artwork, whether it's just in my daily, how I move throughout the world. Um, how to honor that, um, those relationships mm -hmm. that I personally have, you know, um, to those communities. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a challenge. It's mm. been um, a pleasure. It's been, there's been tears, there's been lots of laughter. Um, and I'm just like so grateful to have been able to like get to know all of you a little bit better and learn more about your practices, your voices. Um, that particularly has been especially rewarding. So. Mm -hmm. You want to close us off, Devin? Wow, no pressure. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, again, what everyone has already said, I, I feel the same exact way. I, I think when I began this fellowship, and I, I think uh, honestly just with my practice in general, it's, it's, it's really an attempt to, to trust. Mm. Um, and I think it gets back to the surrender thing, gets back to the truth thing. I think that it all kind of like works together. It's my understanding of those things. And so I think this opportunity to work with people I haven't worked with before, to be in a place I've never been in before, um, to trust those encounters, mm -hmm. you know, to again, not be right about them, not, not be possessive of them, to get out of the way so that truth and trust can happen. And I think that's essentially what this fellowship has been, is another kind of exercise in that, which has only kind of fortified the next exercise. You know, mm -hmm. it, it really kind of affirms like, oh, this can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and it feels good to actually trust that. It feels good to give yourself permission to trust the thing you don't know. It feels good to give yourself permission to not be possessive about a thing and see what can happen when you get out the way. And uh, I'm excited to keep trusting and keep trying and um, yeah, participate. That's awesome. Um, I guess that, you know, wraps up um, this program. Um, 
I'd like to thank our audience for joining us in this virtual panel discussion today. I mean, it's been a delight um, sharing these ideas um, with you all, but also sharing the stage um, with these fellows. Um, we're looking forward to everything that they're making um, and what they're going to make and what step into. Um, I'd like to also thank our generous sponsors, um, Northern Trust and Terra Foundation, for making the fellowship possible and this exhibition possible, really. Um, I'd like to thank our friends at Expo Chicago for partnering with us again um, on a program like this. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the museum um, for their work, supporting this work, um, and putting this all together. Um, so the tale of today, Emerging Artist Fellowship Exhibition, um, will still be on view um, at the museum till April 18th. Please visit our website to get your tickets in advance, and we'll see you soon.